Welcome to Euro Onco platform. My name is Paweł Rajwa. I am from Poland and it's a great honor for me to have today Professor Waltz from Marseille, France. Uh, we would like to talk today about uh, response uh, in response criteria in metastatic hormone sensitive prostate cancer and also about novel therapies in metastatic castration resistant disease. So what do you think? Uh, are we are already there to start personalized medicine in metastatic hormone sensitive disease? It's a very good question. That's actually where we aim for. We would like to fine-tune the best treatment for the right patient at the right time with the right uh, treatment for, for this. Um, optimizing cancer control at the same time, side effects. Mm -hmm. And a given in the hormone-sensitive stage is the doublet between ADT and the novel hormone agent. Um, that is what we give in a systematic fashion. Then you might decide if we add a triplet chemotherapy to it or not. And, and that is still not really clear who might be the sweet spot for it. Probably patients with visceral metastases are those where you might add chemotherapy if the patient is fit for it. High grade disease, isograde group 5, probably are those patients who are a good candidates. High volume disease probably are the patients for the, uh, the, the right patients for this kind of treatment. And then when it comes to the decision Inside of the RPs, I don't think that we have something too more specific that would allow us to go for a personalized medicine. It's rather what kind of comorbidities the patient has, what kind of treatments are ongoing, and then trying to find the best match where we can have an effective treatment and as little side effects as possible on the long term mm -hmm. for a patient because there might be already some underlying comorbidities that might go worse under this treatment. And what do you think about genetics? Are we ready to, to use it in the, MHSPC the, There was this year at ESMO a very nice analysis from Stampede where they looked at the same question, doublet versus triplet, who might get the best benefit out of a triplet treatment relative to a doublet treatment and see the decipher score seems to be very effective here to identify those who might get the benefit out of the very intensified upfront treatment. Um, we would probably need to have the full publication of this to understand how much that really influences our daily work, but that is very interesting and, and probably that is where we can go into this individualized medicine approach. We need additional information. Right now we are unable to get that additional information, but genomics is likely to provide us with this information. Okay, and once you start your treatment, uh, how do you monitor response in men with metastatic hormone sensitive prostate cancer? We are lucky that we, we have PSA, even though we discuss a lot of this biomarker being suboptimal and we need other biomarkers. I think in, in prostate cancer, we are really lucky to have this biomarker. It gives us information about the diagnosis, gives us information about treatment, if it's a local disease or metastatic disease. And if we have hormone sensitive disease, usually the PSA response is visible. And as long as the disease responds to the treatment, the PSA will remain low. So that is something that gives us a possibility to monitor how effective the treatment upfront is. Um, and then we also know the deeper the PSA response is, the better the outcome of the patient. It's mm -hmm. a no-brainer. Yeah? You, you see they have really a complete response there. And if the PSA is below 0.2, for example, you know that the patient will do way better than patients who do not have that deep PSA response. And, and this gives them the possibility to think what needs to be added maybe if you have a poor response or what you might uh, take out if you have a very good response. Okay. And then there's always the question, do we need routine imaging in these patients to make sure that we do not have like a disconnected PSA response where you have uh, progressions, radiological progressions somewhere else. Um, I would not do that in a systematic fashion in a classical patient. If you have a patient with visceral metastases, which is, uh, for my opinion, a proxy of other tumor biology, then I would go for for conventional imaging on a regular basis. And if I have a classical patient, bone metastases, maybe lymph node metastases, I would rather rely on the PSA. But mm -hmm. probably it's not an error to do uh, on a regular basis in conventional imaging, bone scintigraphy and CT, make sure that you do not uh, miss a progression that PSA is not able to capture. Yeah. And what if PSMA PET was performed initially and it's like the may? <laughs> that, that is a very good question. Probably something we are coming up with more and more frequently we have high risk or very high risk patients where we might skip the conventional imaging at the beginning, go for a PSMA pad there, finding metastatic disease, treat the patients, and then yeah, we have a difficulty to monitor our patients, see where a response is or not. Extrapolate then the information from the PSMA to conventional imaging is very challenging. And a solution might be to do then a conventional imaging of these mm -hmm. patients as a baseline examination, which I think makes a lot of sense because this is way more accessible. PSMA remains a precious resource and I don't see like 
being disused in a systematic fashion, even in metastatic patients. So that is a challenging thing. Um, I don't think that that is the current sweet spot of PSMA imaging, like monitor patients with advanced disease, very advanced disease. Okay, thank you very much. So now I would like to ask you about metastatic castration resistant prostate cancer. What do you think about the novel therapies that are emerging? That is a very interesting field, and, and many of the drugs we currently use on a hormone sensitive stage were at the beginning used in the castrate resistant field. So it's our, let's say, uh, experimental field where we can see what, what drugs are available. We have obviously now PARP inhibitors, which became a standard in this situation if you have patients that are muted uh, in favor of an HRR uh, mutation. Um, still, there are several mutations that might be or might generate a treatment with PARP inhibitors. Uh, obviously, the most uh, uh, important one are the BRCA mutations. Uh, CDK12 might be of uh, interest. Uh, PALB2 might be of interest. ADM was one of the usual suspects. It looks, looks like that these are not the sweet spot of PARP inhibition, at least not that straightforward. And that is probably what helps us to identify those who are best treated with these PARP inhibitors. But this will represent only 10 to 15 percent of our patients. Mm -hmm. It's more a niche. And then we have nowadays the possibility to add uh, um, indeed, the, the radio ligand treatment, which is uh, going now from third line treatment to uh, before chemotherapy, which is very interesting. And we have just from ESMO a very interesting data coming up from the PSMA4 study as well as from SPLASH. And, and we see here that uh, indeed this is effective in, in these patients and, and helps uh, to have another treatment option in these patients. And the problem we have nowadays while treating the patient in the hormone sensitive stage with a doublet or a triplet, we will very soon be then in the castroid resistance stage with an absence of the classical treatment options. And this is why it's a good news that we have this radio ligand treatment now available, the PARP inhibitors available. Okay. We still have chemotherapy with cabazitaxel as a good option in this situation. So we, we need then to select what kind of treatment was there before, what the response might have been to see where we should change the mode of action where we might keep a certain treatment ongoing. Um, good news is we have different options nowadays available, which was not the case for some years. And there are some new emerging therapies that probably will come in the next few years. Um, what do you think could, could be the most promising of those who will arrive soon? I think we're still not yet at the end on, on everything that is focusing on the androgen receptor pathway inhibitor. We have some, some new drugs coming on, having a really very deep uh, suppression of, of any um, androgen or hormone production that might be of, of, of use here. Um, we see, I think there's a lot of things ongoing. We'll also see if uh, the radio ligand treatment switching from lutetium, a beta emitter, to an alpha emitter. Actinium is not something more effective in this situation, maybe at second line, third line. Um, and we have tools that will allow us to identify those who might be good candidates, like strong PSMA expression, even after initial treatment. If you maintain the PSMA expression, they might still be good candidates for an actinium treatment, alpha, alpha meta treatment. Mm -hmm. So I think there's still some more to, things to come, and uh, I think uh, we, we will go forward with this treatment in mm -hmm. these very advanced cases. And regarding you know, radiologic therapy, uh, how do you feel also it will evolve in metastatic hormone sensitive disease and metastatic castration resistant prostate cancer? How, how do you see the role of, of this type of treatment in the future? We had uh, at ESMO the, the upfront PSMA study finally uh, presenting from, from Australia. It's a phase two looking at uh, the adding of, of lutetium treatment to chemotherapy in, in the hormone sensitive stage, uh, improving the, the PSA response, the deep PSA response in those patients who are treated with combination. So there's a strong sign that indeed uh, in this situation you might add efficacy. Um, obviously, uh, it's not yet un really clear how to we identify the best patients and how we actually manage the situation where you might indeed get a response after a first cycle of ADT, maybe chemotherapy, and the radio ligand treatment, meaning you don't have any PSMA expression anymore, why would you then do a PSMA radio ligand treatment? So some issues to explore, how many cycles we need in this situation, do we need to fine tune the treatment, see what still remains as PSMA expression, and adapt then the number of cycles according to the PSMA expression. Uh, but it's good to see that the phase two in homosensitive stage showed an efficacy, and this opens the door now to go forward in, in, into, uh, into other studies. And we have uh, phase uh, three studies ongoing this field as well, mm -hmm. which, which should report probably next year in the two years' time. Okay, so thank you very much for your response and for your insightful interview. And uh, we are looking forward definitely to see uh, the new therapies coming into the 
field. Thank you very Pleasure. much. Thank you very much.